My name is Tommy Kraft, and I'm the writer, director, and executive producer on Star Trek Horizon, and I never listen to the G&T show. G&T show is intended for mature audiences. Parental discussion is advice. Live long and prosper, bitches. Friends with benefits. <laughs> Speaking of having a good time, Terry. Mm-hmm. Dayton broke <laughs> the GNT show. This is now the David Mack <laughs> Appreciation <laughs> Hour. You asshole. <laughs> what is it about this guy that people love him so much? With his purple velvet cape and his crown. I thought it was a little much when he had us carry him in the studio on a throne. I am awesome! Look what I have done! Look what I have brought upon the world! There is an urge to go nyan 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 nyan. I heard rumors that you might be working on something else, but we won't pry much. <laughs> I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna pry a little. <laughs> dare you! How dare you ask me to change it? Do you not understand the majesty of my genius? <laughs> and the guy sitting next to me looked at me like he was, you know, like I'd crapped in his hat. Yeah, it's the professionalism yeah. that sells the show. That's right. And hello, ladies and germs. Welcome to another episode, supplemental log, if you will, of the GNT show. Uh, if you look to my right, your left, there she is, all bedazzled. It looks like she got a bedazzler this week, and I really like the I love the fonds on the back of your dress. It's Terry. Hey. <laughs> and to my left, your right, there he is, wearing his leather his leather coat over top of his Klingon armor, Ceridium. Kapla. And Joe Lon Truall. I am, of course, Gettysburg 7. And we are very, very proud and honored to have with us tonight Mr. Tommy Kraft from Star Trek Horizon. And if you don't know about it, you will by the end of this, but I can tell you they have the coolest logo in the world. It's the same logo I have tattooed on my leg, that of the Romulan Empire. Welcome, <laughs> sir. Joe Lon True. I, I, I mean, <laughs> I know you already said friend. it, but, it, but it, it's, it's fitting. So, what the heck? Yes. Sorry, what the hell? I was probably swear. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Bravo, I welcome really do. to the GNT show. It is I broken. really do have that tattoo. Of, really? Yeah. That's awesome. Yes. I should get one too. Yes. Hey. Because Klingons get more than enough. Yes. Yeah. Oh, please. I agree. Oh, Thank yeah, here you. We go. Thank you, a right thinking American. I also think we need to get <laughs> more Cardassians too. But Yes. Yes, because Kim has worn out her welcome. Kim. <laughs> Oh, Kim Kardashian. Uh Oh, (laughs) you silly, silly man. Yes, I get you. Thank you. No, but I agree. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure if my next my next tattoo is going to be the new Romulan symbol from Star Trek Online, which is the official CBS blessed uh, Romulan Romulan Republic. I'm sorry, symbol, or if I'm going to go with the Cardassian symbol. It is pretty cool, the new one. I have to admit that would be very tempting. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I didn't know well, it was CBS Blessed, though. That's cool. Yeah, everything that gets done through Star Trek Online gets gets the cross of blessing because oh. it is a licensed product, so everything they create needs right. to be approved. At least that's what we've been told, and so far I haven't I haven't heard otherwise. <laughs> yeah. my, my, my question to you is, or actually I'm going to – some of our listeners may not know exactly – all of the different roles that you are playing in Star Trek or in the project of Star Trek Horizon. So you're the executive producer. You're also the writer. What else are you doing, you you jack of all trades? <laughs> well, ex- executive producer is basically just what I call myself so I don't feel too full of myself because <laughs> – once once you start naming all these, it does sound kind of narcissistic, but uh, I'm the costumer. I've sewn all the costumes um, from scratch, I might add, except for the Iconian uniforms. Those were some modified things, but uh, I'm doing the music as well as visual effects, 3D modeling, texture and rendering, um, and writer, director, as you mentioned, cinematographer, editor, um, compositor, but that goes into visual effects. Um, probably some other stuff. 
I don't know. I mean, it's basically whatever needs to be done, I, I find myself winding up doing it. And wow. That that maybe maybe just the guy who does things could be my title. The guy who does things. Okay, that's what we'll that's what we'll call you. <laughs> it almost sounds like Pac led. You know, he's he, he makes it go. <laughs> he makes it go. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm I'm um, I think personally even more impressed now because I've seen both the trailer and the first. Uh, scene of Star Trek Horizon that you've got posted on uh, your own webpage, which for our listeners is www.startrekhorizon.com. There's no S on that. Just Horizon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also your Kickstarter page, which the link can be found through there. I'm I'm utterly impressed, and I have to. You've done all of the visual effects. How long has it taken you just to do those few scenes? Well, um, I started probably a year ago, January ish, um, with pre production. And the first things I started doing were modeling the interior of the ship with the bridge and the corridor um, and the exterior of the actual ship itself. Um, and we didn't start shooting until last October. And so it was around then when I started doing the actual compositing and stuff for the scenes. And as a frame of reference for the Iconian scene, um, that was pretty much, oh, geez, I don't even know. The problem is you work on these things for so long that it just kind of becomes a blur. But, you know, I could. it was easily well over hundreds of hours of work just for that scene because I not only had to model the uh, the world gate the space station thing but you know I had to do all the uh, motion tracking of the camera and the camera <sighs> movement rendering the animation texturing it and then finally I could composite the live action footage which in itself could easily take more than a few hours just for one shot just to do the compositing absolutely uh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So beautiful work that you've done. Thank I you. Mean, that tra- that opening scene for when I blew, when I watched it for the first time, it just blew my mind. I was like, I had to, I had to watch it again just yeah, to make sure. I had to. I had to say, I kind of got, which for me and with what we call the unofficial productions, um, mm-hmm. I I got I got tingles, and that's Ooh. yeah, I did. I got tingles. Um, it was exceptionally done, exceptionally well done, and uh, and intriguing at the same time. And I'm and we're excited to kind of have you here to talk a little bit Thank you. Ab- about the the story. And we don't want you to feel like you have to give spoilers. As a matter of fact, you know, we'll we'll let you direct us on on what you would like to discuss about this story or not. And uh, but I, I think my my big question is is that you seem to have taken on a unique approach to the Iconian storyline. Mm-hmm. And for our listeners, Star Trek Horizon actually occurs in and around the Enterprise era. Is that, would you, would you right, say that's yeah. correct? That's the, that's the main era. And the only time it doesn't uh, take place there is with that opening scene because it's like a prologue. Okay. It, which takes place what several million years ago? Uh, two hundred and fifty thousand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Still. <laughs> yeah. Very long. Time. I mean, it's not explicitly said, but um, it's implied when the narrator says two hundred and fifty thousand years ago. Years the ago. Airway. Yeah. And then you just kind of assume that that's when that specific scene is taking place. Well. It, very. Yeah. Very cool. It's a very fascinating idea. Now. Um, the rest of the sh- the film, which is actually a feature length film that you're working on, as opposed to a series of right. episodes, correct? Yes. Uh, t- I guess my co- I- I'm so blown away by the whole idea <laughs> of it. So I, pre- I, have I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Mike. Now, uh, there's a lot of fan productions out there right now, and all of them tend to pick you know something safe, TOS. Why Enterprise? <laughs> Well, um, <clears throat> it's a long story, and I don't want to rehash too much of things I've said before, but basically around a year and a half, two years ago, when I was first considering doing this project, I was going through a really hard time 
um, with a lot of depression. And it had a lot to do with, um, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody, but really with religious issues and, uh, being brought up that way and being afraid to follow science and being led away from religion. And eventually what really helped me with enterprise and giving me something to focus on was the explorer's heart. Um, and it gave me the courage to study science. And I, I mean, not to offend religion, religious people out there, but I consider myself an atheist now. And, um, you know, I, it's, I would say it saved my life actually doing that. And I can, I would attribute a lot of that to enterprise, giving me the courage to do that through characters like Jonathan Archer and, uh, the whole crew because they were the first ones out there to do that exploring. And it, it inspired me so much that I did it myself, and it helped me through that hard time. And so um, it gave me the personal motivation and the passion to do, to sink, you know, years into a project, into a Star Trek project that I wouldn't have otherwise had for yeah. this kind of film. I think that's a, a, a wonderful story. And, um, not on, and, and I want to say it probably runs parallel to many, um, yeah. who, who, who find that anchor in, in television shows, not just, you know, Star Trek, but what it is that inspires them. They find inspiration from them. And it's, it's for me, it was a big thing of Oreos. <laughs> Whatever works. Yeah. No, Oreos actually, are pretty great. I, no, I was going to say that's not true. Terry and Mike and, and, and our our small but dedicated listenership are aware that a couple of years ago I went through a, a depression like that as well. And uh, Neil Gaiman's The Sandman was oh. one of the things that, that – and hence now three tattoos of Sandman that I had. <laughs> I, <laughs> because well, he, he makes movies, I get tattoos, you know? <laughs> well, I, I think that's a, a, a wonderful story and a very inspirational one and one that is not surprising in any way, shape, or form. I mean, we all find that connection, you know, to those characters. Now, who is your favorite? Should we even ask him this? Why not? Who's your favorite character in Enterprise? Is it Archer or is it someone else? It is Archer. I, I have to admit, it's the easy choice. Followed probably by a trip, of course. You would, so. you know, you'd be surprised in the number of interviews we've done with people and with our show. Because, Mike, what what episode are we up to now on our weekly show? One forty, one forty one. Two, one forty two. Next week. Ar- Archer would not be the overwhelming first choice, I think, or or wouldn't be his first first ballot as as, as you think with with people. Um, I think Trip would be. Yeah, that's true. Probably. Actually, you know, I, now you mentioned that. That's true. I have heard a lot of a, people say that. There's a lot of uh, angst about Archer because he was so post 9-11 in, in the writing of him. Yeah, I mean, he was, but it, I thought it worked so well for the character in the show. Oh, I did too. I did too. He, he was the character of Archer. He was he was closer to us than, than Kirk. You know, he was... He oh, was, yeah as flawed as we were essentially you know he's he had he 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 had lived through some shit so to speak so right yeah, but he no did doubt. have his very strong uh moral center and um he he had a very firm idea of what he believed in and what he thought uh people should be and and how we should interact with each other he may not have always known how to go about that, especially earlier on. But one of the things that I liked about him was his passion for that and his passion for exploring. Right. Mm-hmm. I agree. Well, it just so happens that Enterprise is my second favorite show, believe it or not, behind TNG. TNG, of course, is my first and favorite. And you never really lose your first love. No, but after that, sure. um, uh, Enterprise is absolutely my second favorite Star Trek uh, iteration. And a lot of that was just because of how different it really was from uh, TNG in that. Um, and and to be honest with you, it, I wish that I think everybody on the planet wishes that it had gone on because there were stories that just needed to be told about how did that it, how did that uh, that jump from kind of a fractured alien society that Earth was dealing with you know, 
a new alien, you know, dealing with alien influx and the attack after the Zindi attack. Um, and I really loved the idea of, you know, how does a society deal with its, its own fracturing of people who don't trust and, and live off fear? I'm, I'm sad that we never really got to explore those stories in Enterprise because of the cancellation. Oh, yeah, me too. And I think, you know, it's the, the unification of people is, one, is like my favorite aspect of Star Trek. And I think it's one of the most interesting stories that could be explored within any franchise. And, um, it, you know, just this idea of how could people come together and unite in peace and common cause. And um, I think it's such a fertile ground that, you know, we don't see tapped very often. You know, usually when you see space epics, they, you know, it's it's always like this United Earth government or something that takes people to, to space. But you don't often see very much like this idea of a future where we actually get to see what brings people together or or how we get to that place, you know. Yeah, it's usually after the fact when when all the hard work's already done is usually where those stories take uh, kick off. Yeah, that's true. And and I I mean the next project I'm even thinking about doing is an original project that would tell that kind of story because I think there's just so much untapped potential. I mean, you can definitely still have your aliens and all the other stories that we love for sci-fi, and you can still and very much have the focus be on how we bring people together. I I can't agree more. I really can't. Now, uh, tell us a little bit about the characters and what we might be able to expect a little bit in a general term without giving away spoilers of, of the characters that we can expect uh, from Horizon. I already have a crush on one. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Lieutenant Tamar. I, oh, I don't blame you. <laughs> I was going to say, I love the fact that he even asked you, Nick. I thought that was pretty awesome. <laughs> um, uh, so we do, we have Lieutenant Tamar, and she is a Romulan defector. And before anybody gets too worried, uh, she was part of a Tal Shiar operation where she was going to go undercover and infiltrate Starfleet. And as part of that mission, she received genetic alterations to essentially become human. And so that way we do save face with the canon. Um, you don't actually see the Romulan or, you know, get their genetics or whatever. And it adds a lot to her character because it adds this extra element of can we really trust her? You know, she, she looks human. Maybe this is all part of her plan to, to infiltrate Starfleet. So there's that. And then, of course, we have our usual roles. We have Captain Harrison Hawk, who's the lead. And we have Lieutenant Tom Samuels, who is the tactical officer. And Commander Jackson Gates as the first officer science officer. And Commander Francis Brooks as the engineer. And the comm officer is um, Marie Sutherland. I could only think of her real name for a minute. Uh, <laughs> but... And I tried to, it, one of the things I thought about was how do I do characters that are interesting, that aren't just like Enterprise's characters. And sometimes I think I just had to go with it. You know, there's the young girl, the, the girl who plays the comm officer is the young girl. She's 25. But I don't think she's like Hoshi, so that's good. Um and the chief engineer, he's dealing with a lot of struggle with the Romulans uh, because he has some history with them in this war. And so because of that, he has a lot of issues with Tamar, too, and adjusting to her presence because she gets assigned to the NX-04. And he has to work alongside of her now, and that's very hard for him to accept. And so that's a, a key point. And all the while, you have Captain Hawk, who is trying to mediate this and mediate his own feelings for the Romulans, having been in this war now for a while, and also having history with aliens doing not nice things um, to him. And so he's trying to, to struggle with, to deal with that. 
while maintaining this idea of what is it what does it mean to be a peaceful united race or um, government and he really wants to bring people together but he has this big conflict especially with this issue with Tamar now of in the Romulans is that really something that's ever achievable and it's one of the big questions we try to ask with this that's interesting there's the war going on outside and then the quote unquote war going on aboard his own ship right yeah interesting very interesting and and I think a relevant um you know take on even the present day social and um cultural you know situation that we have going on now globally yeah well you know it's as it's it's some it's one of the things we see as the internet continues to expand and quote unquote civilized culture or developed culture uh continues to expand and it's how do we integrate with everyone right. and how do we bring people together and it's, you know, it's it's kind of one of the most important things to me personally, too, which is why it was became, especially because of the things that were influencing me at the time of writing with my shift in religious views and everything, um, you know, this idea of bringing humanity together, together peacefully. And then even if we can do that, will it be possible to, if there are other uh, races out there, can we bring them into this peaceful right. fold or alliance as well? And I think it's a very pertinent question to ask, and what does it take to do that? Well, I have to I, ask you then, how how old are you, sir? I'm 22, nearly 23. Oh, wow. That's amazing. It's a so, baby. <laughs> so, know, I've been right? told. That's what I've been told. <sighs> no, I'm just thinking about... Jesus Christ! Wait, wait, what? Wait a minute! What year was? What, what year were you born? Because I just 91. went. To, oh my God! <laughs> what what month? What month? May. Fuck. Was, <laughs> what song was, was May? May? I was still in Kuwait for the first Gulf War. Um. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Christ. Uh, so what? Um. What, <laughs> aside down, so. aside from Star Trek, what have been your influences in 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 science fiction or just writing? I mean, like Asimov or or what? What have been your influences? Um, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens. Oh, um, okay. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, you know, it's your science guys. Your science. Yeah. And your, and yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Well, because you know, it's. Well, I've read like, the God Delusion. I've gone. I, he's he's one of my favorite. Dawkins was one of my and still is one of my favorite authors. Oh. And yeah. uh, Hitchens, you know, was an inspiration until he died not too long ago to yeah. me as well. Um, and and so I can really understand that because they they are pioneers. Yeah. In their own and, way. You know, it's because especially it's funny with Dawkins, especially because I went to a, a really tiny Christian school growing up and um, they were, you know, everything they taught there was like evolution is bad. I remember we'd watch Bill Nye occasionally in science class and every time evolution would come up, they'd say, all right, now just just don't listen to that part. Just ignore it. Um and we, one of my, I, th I don't know, it was probably like sophomore year, they took us to see that Ben Stein movie, Expelled. Have you heard of it? No. Uh, it, he did a movie that was Oh, I, yeah. I heard through the great, I never did see it. I never did see it. Where? It's, yeah. it's a hilarious movie. Um, <laughs> but at the time, he interviewed Dawkins with the movie, in the movie, and at the time, seeing it, I remember saying to your friend, man, Ben Stein just destroyed Dawkins. And looking it up again recently, it's like, wow, what was I watching? <laughs> and But, you know, w when I started searching, the, one of the very first names, you know, I started searching for outside of religion. One of the very first names I typed in was Richard Dawkins right. um, for on YouTube and on Google. And... His writing and his documentaries have had a huge influence on me and my change. And, you know, it, from there it just kind of spiraled. I, I love all the science guys from Bill Nye to Neil deGrasse Tyson, Sean Carroll, you know, um, Lawrence Krauss, and, you know, a lot of the more probably obscure ones. But in terms of like, 
creative influences, you know, that's pretty much like all over the board. I've, for, even as a little kid, it started young when I loved Star Trek and Stargate and Star Wars and all the, you know, Marvel movies all the way back to X-Men, Spider-Man. I've loved all those. I've always, I mean, look, basically sci-fi superhero kind of stuff. That's like, that's my thing. That makes me happy. Yeah. Well, the, who, are your, who are some of your Are you DC, Marvel, or is there something? Well, I'm not specifically one or the other, um, but yeah. I do prefer Marvel just because that's the one that I've kind of gotten into over the years. It's just the one I'm most familiar with. And I don't really read most of the comics, honestly, but I love the movies. And okay. that's, you know, and those have been a huge inspiration to me as well as, you know, especially growing up with these when they were new with the style and the visual effects that I've kind of seen evolve over the years have been as, as somebody who's obviously very interested in visual effects too. It's been quite an inspiration to me. These movies have. I'll tell you tonight uh, on tonight's episode, it's the last episode before the season finale of uh, arrow. I twice, I literally sat up and cheered. <laughs> that is like the best. I love that show. Now, are you a fan of agents of shield? I am. I I I, I kind of love that show. Okay, uh, that's that, that, I'll movie. tell you this last week that that was a tense episode. This last yeah. Week. Um, in fact, ever since they did the Hydra thing, it's been really yeah. good. I mean, like I liked it before, but now it's like it. They really. In, it's gone from like a four to a nine. Yeah. And See, not, for, so for me, it went to from a five to a nine. I, I would give it a little <laughs> bit better than that. I was watching it from day one, and I never. I never did give up, but I can understand why some people did. Yeah. I hope they come back to the fold because it, the, the show really just took off. I just hope that, spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen it yet, but I hope that they don't try to turn around Ward somehow because, like, that was my favorite yeah. twist I've ever seen. Because, like, I, especially because it's Marvel, you know, and the way the show had been, I would not have expected him to to real for to be that kind of character for them to really fully commit to that. I I, don't, I, I don't thought know. that Bill Paxton was so amazing this week. Oh yeah, he that was yeah. just unbelievable. And I know Mike hasn't seen he'll see Arrow tomorrow. Do you watch Arrow? I haven't. I've been meaning to, but I haven't watched it yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> if I'm reading, Mike, this is not a spoiler because you'll see it at the end when they show the next week. It looks like. The Reja Ghoul Army, uh, oh. I'm sorry, the League of Assassins, and I'm even thinking Suicide Squad join Arrow and Black Canary in their war against Slade Wilson, Deathstroke. It's like, I was just, oh, I had to get a, a sham wow. <laughs> I love how they tie all these things in with the, it, I, you know, I, I think S.H.I.E.L.D. was probably the first one. Where was Arrow first? I don't remember. Uh, like, Arrow, Arrow's been tying in with yeah. like, the TV universe, but not the. But the, what I just read was that the upcoming Justice League movie that's been announced, they're going to use the actors from the the DC TV shows that are currently on. So hmm. the Flash show that's getting ready to come on and Arrow. So it'll be interesting to see if that's what they actually do. Now, isn't Batman or Batman versus Superman and Man of Steel? Aren't these also in the quote unquote DC cinematic universe? Yeah, they're in the DC Cinematic Universe, and then the Justice League movie that will follow that, which will also be Zack Snyder, uh, is supposed to be in that universe, too. So uh, Arrow has done a good job of, like you were saying, that S.H.I.E.L.D. does with Winter Soldier and all of that. Um, they had, like, a backdoor pilot for for Flash to show Barry Allen uh, getting, getting hit by the lightning and the chemicals, and then uh, this Cyrus Gold getting knocked out and, you know, he becomes Solomon Grundy. So they've done a really good job of, of, of keeping that. And they're very good at dropping little, little Easter eggs for the DC universe. Like, um, you know, I'm going to go visit your cousin in Bloodhaven kind of thing. Right. I, I think both shows are probably pretty good at that. Cause I've noticed they do a lot of that on shield too. And in the Marvel universe as a whole, did you catch the man thing reference two weeks ago? When uh, Agent Hill was walking out and she was talking oh, on yeah. the phone and she said, yeah, they asked me about something called the man thing. I don't even know what that is. And that's like <laughs> the, there was also a man thing reference in Winter Soldier. So that's got my ears perked up as to you know, yeah. what, what they're going to do. 
That must have gone right over my head. I don't know how did I miss that. <laughs> because if you're like, you're so excited to see yeah. Colby Smolders on, on. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Did you guys check out the Gotham trailer? Yes, I did. Of course I did. Of course Nick did. <laughs> I haven't seen it. No, is it good? That. That was the joke that Elliot put on on Facebook today. He said, or that it wasn't Elliot. It was somebody who put it on Facebook that said that they thought that it would be a great idea that if you name the baby Gotham, name the baby Gotham, so that oh, way in the middle Erica, of the night, our it was Erica. Erica. That's who it was. Yeah. Yeah, name your baby Gotham so in the middle of the night when the baby cries, the mother can turn to look to the father and say, Gotham needs you, and they're going to get up and help the man. <laughs> That's kind of awesome. That's, I like that. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, kind of going to be back a little bit to those kinds of inspirations uh, to get back to your process a little bit about not just to write, because I know that you work on more than just Star Trek Horizon. You actually have other projects out there as well. Um, when it comes to actually writing your characters, do you take a, a, a like what we would call a conservative approach, where you sit down, you write a, a hard script out, or do you? How do you go about outlining the uh, the plot of your story and then entering in and getting the characters' dialogue put together? What's what's your actual writing process? Uh, it really kind of just depends on my mood and the project, and with this one. I knew that I wanted, like, my main goal was to wrap up story threads from Enterprise. It was kind of like this mission that I started where, you know, I had this show that I loved and I I wanted to make my contribution to it. Uh-huh. And so I took a number of story threads from the show that I thought could use finishing or more answers. And the main things um, were... Some, a little bit to do with the founding of the Federation, but there's not too much of that, but some of that. And most importantly, Future Guy, and also <laughs> most importantly, the Romulan War. Um, and and for those of you, you all know who Future Guy is, I assume. He's the shadowy figure that always oh, gave orders the- to the Suliban. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, and so I approached it starting with outlining for this project, and... Because I, I wasn't really sure how I wanted to go about it. And originally it was supposed to be a 20-minute short film. But as I started outlining, I was thinking, you know, this outline is taking several pages. There's no way this is going to be a short film. And so I just kind of went with the outline for a while, and I got stuck on the outline. So I just started writing the script. And it was about halfway, probably a little more than halfway through the script where I stopped on the outline and I just finished the script from there without the outline. So I had a a general idea of what I wanted. But, you know, if I'm doing a short film, I'll probably just sit down and write something or but for something more complex like this, I'll sketch out a few ideas. But for me, the, the part of the process that's the most interesting is just writing dialogue and writing character interactions, which is why it's hard for me to just sit down at the outset and, you know, write like a sheet. Captain Hawk has these character traits. I'd rather just kind of write a scene and see what comes of it. Uh-huh. So you, you definitely don't start off with any kind of character Bible, or do your character Bibles come after your scripts are written? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, for for this, I knew I, I had like a set of characters I knew I had to have more or less because I was following the Enterprise mold of or the Star Trek mold in general, I should say, of Captain, Science Officer, Tactical Officer, Helm, and uh, Engineer and Com Officer. But other than that, no, it's just pretty much go where the flow takes me, and then I have an idea of what I want, and then I'll go back and do rewrites and, you know, maybe a little bit more specific outlining on the side after the fact to clean it up and make it a lot more cohesive. Now, how did you find your cast? Uh, It was a little bit of people I knew and a little bit of casting calls. The captain was somebody I met when I was doing cinematography for a short film, and the director of that short film I was doing cinematography on is the guy who's playing the first officer. And he's somebody I've known and worked with for a couple of years now. So for those two people, I just asked them if they do it because I, I knew their talents and abilities and I knew that they would work well for the roles that I was asking them for. 
But some of the other ones, and also the same for Lieutenant Tamar, I actually went to uh, college with her and did theater classes with her. But Very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell her you said so. Um, and uh, the others were casting call mainly, engineer and... Uh, and actually, some of them are friends of friends, too. The comm officer, the captain introduced me to her and said that she's really great, you know, and, and she'd be good for this movie. So I asked her if she'd be interested in doing an audition, and she did, and and she's really good. So it's just basically uh, – oh, one other thing I, I always like to mention is the engineer actually did four Trek fan films like 10 years ago, back when he was just starting in film school at Full Sail. And for any of you fan film buffs out there, they were the uh, Encarta movies, Star Trek oh Encarta. Gosh. Have you seen I those? Re- oh, I remember those. Yeah. yeah wow, that that's was, cool. Yeah. When in fact, he, and he it's cool too because he lives right here in Michigan. And when I posted the casting call, he said I couldn't believe I saw someone doing a Star Trek fan film, and I just had to see what this was about. And so. He uh, he did his audition, and I really liked it. And then we started talking Star Trek, and of course, then we were the best of friends right away because he's a huge Trekkie. So that was a pretty neat little find. Kind of makes me feel like the world's just that much smaller. That's very, very cool. Well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the the current state of the Kickstarter uh, that you have got out there. For our listeners, Star Trek Horizon has a Kickstarter. It has already been, for the most part, funded. Now they're just working on stretch goals, and they have 11 days to go as of the date this was being recorded, um, which, of course, is May 7th, 2014. Um, you're currently sitting at about just under $17,000 of a $10,000 goal. And it looks like you've got a couple of stretch goals that you're within shot of. Uh, what stretch goals do you want to make the most? I mean, other than the the big one, right? Um, which one would you really are just really looking forward on working on? I I would be happy uh, with, with hitting the $20,000 stretch goal, but obviously the, the one that I really want to hit is the $25,000 one because, I mean, if we don't get there, because the, the main point of that one is to make sure we have enough money to try and get Scott Bakula and Connor Trenier and Gary Graham interested in, you know, shooting for a day and doing a couple scenes. But... You know, if we don't make it to 25k, we might still be able to get one of them per day. So, I mean, it's kind of this balancing act, and it just depends on how the numbers play out. But ideally, yeah, I'd like to get up to, you know, throw up to 25k, throw some money at Scott Bakula, and, and <laughs> see if he'd be interested in coming on board. And it's, I mean, I wouldn't expect. I wouldn't expect him to, even if he's the nicest guy on earth, which I've heard he is really nice, I wouldn't expect him to fly out on his own dime and hang out all day yeah, and shoot, you know. And <laughs> you, it's like, you, you, especially because he's pretty well known. So right. I'm sure that it isn't just day rate, whatever he gets. Right. Well, we I, I wish you the best in that, and, and I'm glad that you were able to at least get through a couple of them. And I'm like I said, I'm very excited to see just the amount of work and just the quality of work that you've been able to to do already. I, I'm still my mind is just kind of blown by it for the for the amount of money that you're asking for, which comparatively to other uh, unofficial productions that are out there right now is a pittance. Right. I mean, a pittance. <laughs> well, well that, I mean, that that brings to to mind something I, w- I wanted to to give you credit for and to ask you about. One thing you're, you're very good at in, in is keeping people informed on your progress and showing updates and things like that through your Facebook page and all of that. How important do you, do you find that to be? I think it's really important because I know for me personally, when I see uh, any kind of film on the internet that interests me, including fan films, I'll check out a video and I'll check out the Facebook page. And if there aren't, if there isn't a very strong amount of community, if there isn't a lot of community interaction and or updates, actual updates on the status of the film, 
I'll probably just go off and do something else and lose interest because mm-hmm. for me, I, I like to see how the film is going. I, I just find that I get too anxious if I get really invested in something and I'm just always waiting for updates and they never come. So it's just easier not to worry about it. And that's one thing I'm definitely trying to avoid with this is I want to keep people interested. I want to show them what we're working on. And I don't mind showing work in progress pictures of what I'm working on at the time, you know, stuff like that. And I think people hopefully like to see that kind of stuff too, because Renegades, you know, I, I love the Trek trivia on their page, but I would also like, you know, just a screenshot now and then from them. <laughs> You know, something yeah. that's like, show us something that's like actually happening with the movie. It's a two, it's hour and a half at least, uh, supposedly yeah. pilot episode. You can at least show a screenshot from one scene every now and then. And so that's one of the things that's really important to me is keeping up to date with people. And hopefully well, you people are, appreciate that too. And let's take this opportunity now to get the uh, the sites where people can visit you and follow you if you are on I mean you're on Facebook and then people yeah. can just search under Star Trek Horizon. Yep. Okay. And what about Twitter? I have a personal Twitter, but I don't have one for the movie. And the main reason is the main, there's only really two places that we, well three places that we have updates and that's the YouTube channel and the Facebook page and the official website. And the reason for that is I find that I don't have enough content to keep it interesting between more than that, you know, okay. if I if I have a lot of different... Um, Do you mind if people follow you on your personal Twitter account? Oh, I don't mind at all. It's just then, Tommy G-Dog, so... There you but go. I'm not trying to be a gangster, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... D-W-G or D-O-G? Uh, D-A-W-G, of course. There you go. <laughs> Well, um, well, I just sent, I just found you on Twitter, so I'm starting to follow you now. And, I have a hard um, time tweeting too, just so you know. But I'm trying well, to get better. Well, I don't get that. <laughs> when people say they don't get Twitter or they have a hard time, I don't understand that. I guess because I, 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 we've been in it for so long, Nick. Or, I, well, well, yeah. It's Twitter not is that I don't understand thing. it. It's just that you know I have friends on Facebook, and so I post when I want to post an update, I'll post it on Facebook and. Facebook, yeah. You know, it's, I, I just have a, I have a hard time doing both, getting, in, getting interested in both. <laughs> You're not the only one. You're, you, we have very many. We, we have a lot of friends that are like that. But I'm going to annoy you on Twitter now. Um, <laughs> That's but, fine. It, <laughs> she will too. Trust me. <laughs> now you, you mentioned <laughs> Renegades earlier. Have you had a chance to see? And I'm sure you have. Uh, Star Trek continues. I have, and I think they're doing a fantastic job. I was, um, I always, I liked Phase Two a lot as well, and then I saw it Continues, and I was like, wow, this is because Phase Two is good, but Continues nails the original series look in a way that Continues doesn't. There's just something about it that's like spot it's on. Vic, Vic knows how to stand and walk like Shadow. <laughs> <laughs> he's got the mannerisms. He does. I mean, he does a very good. He does it very well. The the Shatner style. But let's face it. Phase two was was really the, the bar that was everybody oh, yeah. tried to reach for so long that uh, it, it, now people and and James Colley, the you know, originator. You, yeah, you are the originator, and and I always have. I will always have a, a special place in my heart for phase two. And I'm glad they haven't given up on it. I'm glad that they're kind yeah. of letting it evolve. And um, that, but I, again, I mean, phase two really was. It was it was my real first. I mean, outside of it was my first real exposure to unofficial productions. And that's when I went out and I I actually got in touch with a bunch of people at a site called Trek United, which kind of isn't even in existence anymore. And it was. Um, uh, and Kirok Lestock was the fan production guru, and he's the guy that got me onto like Exeter and um, all of the others. That he was like, "Oh, these have been going on for years." And it's like, "Wow, I didn't realize all of this stuff was out there." And just the depth of creativity of Star Trek fans just blew my mind. And I would, when Mike sent me this stuff on Horizon, I was just blown away by how beautiful your work is, and I, I'm just so proud and so happy for you, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to seeing how it all turns out. Uh, yeah, we can't done. Wait. No, well, I have you. to. I appreciate I, that. 
I have to ask this of you. Have you read the Diane Duane's Rihansu series? I have not. Oh, you got to. We have a, that's a high, a high recommendation. We also talk a lot about the, the novelizations, the Star Trek novels that, uh, yeah. you know, we've been, I, I, you know, the problem I find is I'm always I'm literally you're busy. like, yeah, I'm working on this 24 seven. It's all I do. Um, and at the few times when I read, I, I'm usually, this makes me probably sound really, really nerdy, but I'm usually reading like a science book. Yeah. No, that's, that's cool. I, I do like fiction, though, not not to knock on fiction or anything, but I mean, that's but, just why I have a hard time, right. uh, you know, there's only know, so much time. Do you know what the Rihansu series is? Series I don't, is? actually. It's I mean, I assume it's five, Romulan. Yeah, yeah, it's a series of five books that Diane Duane wrote set during the, the original series era. Era? Error. Era. <laughs> it's had a mini stroke, and um, there was solar on radiation leaking, and um, Uh-oh. it... it, it it, it offers an insight, and now Mike is our resident Klingon. I mean, he gets up at the Star Trek Las Vegas and he sings Klingon drinking songs at That's karaoke. Kind of awesome. Yeah, and, and all of that. Now, Mike, you, you read the Rihansu series. And your have, view as a Klingon? I have more respect for for Romulans now than I did before I read the book, <laughs> uh, the series. But I'm still Klingon at heart. Well, so, well, the, the Rihansu. You, know, you, can, I say, you the can Rihansu, educate somebody, but you know you can't. The Rihansu <laughs> series is widely kind of taken as a, a wonderful, creative outline and a great foundation for the culture of of Romulans and where it that also comes shows, from, the spirituality shows, and everything. It also shows how the Romulans evolved from TOS into what we saw in TNG. TNG. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So uh, it, it's really informative, and anyone who, who's thinking about writing for Romulans, it's something that you know we're always pushing. You got to read it. You got to read it because, <laughs> because everybody <laughs> thinks of it as canon now, anyway. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much uh, you know it sets the bar for really what they are like when they're not being devious and underhanded. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's yeah. uh, that Nick. They least, do that so. a lot, at least, though. <laughs> at least unlike the Klingons, Romulans beige. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I said it. Yeah, you said it. One of these days, my friend. One of these. <laughs> now, before before we let you go, Tommy, we have. Are you a fan of Inside the Actors Studio? Yeah, I, I don't know if I'd say I, I'm a fan per se, but I've I've but watched have, it on, on on occasion. We have our version of what we call the James Lipton question. Oh boy! <laughs> yeah. Yes. So yep. they start out easy, and by the end, you'll you'll be you'll you'll be swearing at us. You'll, you'll feel oh, like that's that, a tough that's a tough order. I don't know. <laughs> you'll feel like that guy in the in the first company half hour of uh, Zero Dark Thirty. Um, <laughs> I love that movie so much. Oh, Jessica Chastain. He could. Okay. Tell us how you really feel. Oh God, she would make <laughs> oh, an amazing oh, oh. Romulan. <laughs> she really would. I'll have to, you know what, forget Scott Bakula, and I'll just uh, fire Callie, and she can play the uh, the new defector. I'm sure she'll do it for free, right? No, no, no don't fire Callie. <laughs> okay. Don't, don't fire her. First question. What is your okay. favorite Star Trek series? Enterprise. Easy enough. Easy enough. Yeah. Go if figure. you could be any species in Trek other than human, what species would you be? Ironically, Cardassian. I like it. Go ahead. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Do you want me to explain? Yeah, go ahead. Because oh. th- th- who doesn't? Who doesn't love them? But go ahead. Well, I, I mean, I'm sure everyone assumed it would be Romulan, but I've just, I just, I don't even know exactly what it is. I've just always because found the Cardassians very interesting. Uh, their yeah. culture, their their architecture, Deep Space Nine, of course, was very. I thought it was very beautiful in its style. Um, I, I, I like their personality traits, especially. Um, not to say that I really like acting like Gal Dukat or Garrick, but... Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, <laughs> Garrick is my favorite character in all of Star Trek. So I, I, I love that man, but I don't know if he's necessarily somebody I'd want to emulate in my daily life. <laughs> How about Dukat? <laughs> not Dukat, Damar. I was going to say, yeah, definitely Dukat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Dude, no, 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 he got better. Yeah, I, I could, if you could spend like a week being like Dukat, you know the fun you'd have. Well, especially Dukat towards the end when he had all the power. 
Yeah. But yeah, I, mean, I, I agree. You'd want to dabble and you know it. Because Damar <laughs> was such a great character arc. He was. He did, and he developed and changed a lot. They did a lot with that character. And that says a lot, too, about oh. Casey Biggs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Casey Biggs. He's dreamy. I have a crush on him. He <laughs> doesn't. Get in line, sister. <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. go for go it. Ahead, next question. No, I was going to say next question. Okay. If you were given an opportunity, now we usually ask this of the authors because we've had many of the authors on, and we'll ask it of you, and you can either go with books or, or films or whatever. If you were given an opportunity to write an open-ended series based on one character in Trek, who would it be? Oh, that is an interesting question. Hmm. Yeah, where you could, you know, do a season of episodes just following one character. You know, I it's uh, for the first one that came to mind, and the one that's really sticking Inco. is <laughs> exactly <Inco. laughs> uh, I, Garrick. I think. Yeah. I think he has the, a lot of potential for really interesting stories, both in his future and his past. And he's the kind of character that can really keep an audience guessing and can do, at times, some really bad things, but can also still be likable. He can be an anti-hero, he can be a villain, he can be a full-on hero, but at the end of the day, you still want to watch him. So You know what? Kind of like what Agents of Shield is doing right now with some of the. I just yeah. Got, I just got a brilliant idea oh. for uh, for for uh, a Garrick story. Ooh. Um, you know how at the end of a Cardassian's life, he calls over his family and he tells tells them all their secrets. Yeah. That's the sto- that's oh, yeah. that's oh, the set uh, where he's telling them yeah. the set and he's telling a little bit of everything. Do you think he would actually tell the truth? Well, yes. that's the novel that Andrew I J. Do. Robinson wrote, A Stitch in Time, was kind of like that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I As far as I'm concerned, uh, Garrick was the most honest character in DS9. My, I, tr- I totally believe that with my heart. Uh, why? Like, what makes you say that? Because I don't know. think of him as ever really lying about... He never really lied about himself. People knew who he was, and he accepted that a part of himself. That's true. I, I, but there... I, there were at his, like, at his core, he was he was an honest. Person. There was misdirection there, a lot of misdirection, but never dishonesty, I, I, never. never yeah. And and he never thought of himself as something other than he was, and I appreciated that about his character. A humble tailor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you know what the shame tailor? of it is? He really was a very good tailor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mike. Yes. I feel a cameo for the Klingons of Long Island. <laughs> oh, we better we better get some some <laughs> we better get some of that liquid they like because Mr. Garrick is coming over for dinner tonight. <laughs> that's our that's our own ridiculous series. Yeah, and if, if we could make line. a fan film, it would be the Klingons of Long Island. Long Island. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Michael, what did you do today? <laughs> I died with Anna. You died all you know, every day, but but then you come back. I don't understand. You have no Anna. <laughs> That's why I get to try again tomorrow. <laughs> so, okay, for any for, for any genre, this could go to. What authors' books do you run out to get when released? Ooh, um, I would probably say. Um, well, I mean, I guess it doesn't count anymore. But I would if he was still alive. It'd be Christopher Hitchens. Um, Lawrence Krauss is a good one too. And if you don't know who they are, people, Google it and find yeah. out something new. That's right. Learn something new every day. <laughs> Get on your Google machine. That's right. Yeah. Now, let's see. Okay. Is there, now, even though uh, you're, you know, still a young pop, <laughs> is there a genre that you're just dying to write for? Like, in, 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 would, would a Western interest you or, or a noir, anything like that? Well, I find that if I'm dying to write for something, I'll just write it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there, I, I find a lot of genres interesting. And I might be inclined to do a Western or a noir or a police procedural, what have you. It really just depends on what my inspiration is at the moment. But 
my dream, my dream genre is what I'm doing right now, and that's a sci-fi and or Star Trek movie. Specifically, also, I'd love to do a superhero movie, especially something like, you know, Iron Man-ish. <laughs> that, that, so that's basically, it's basically the sci-fi stuff, which I'm already doing. So. Okay. What's the name of your starship? The USS... I assume we're not in Horizon. Right, not in yeah. correct. Your own personal. Mm. You're the captain you're the cap- of... USS Prophet. P-H or F? Uh, P-H. <laughs> not not <Okay>. Ferengi Prophet. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't Prophet sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I like it. That's, that's cool. That's the name of my ship in Star Trek Online. It's the only thing I could think of that oh, sounds kind of cool. <laughs> Stop the questions, <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> we're, we're all three of us are avid, big time avid stow players. Awesome. Are you in a fleet? I well, see, that's the thing. You're probably going to hate me. Is that I'm I'm a casual stow player. That's okay. I, you do or you don't? Do you know? <laughs> oh, good. Uh, but it's I I play basically when I'm in the mood for it. Which is uh, the problem is I don't I can't ever find anyone to play with. So I'm usually uh, just always playing with the AI are? and. Well, I will join your Somebody's fleet. always on. Yeah. Sweet. I'll do it. Division. Look up Caspian Rising. But it's well, uh, Caspian I'll, Division. I'll get you the link. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I, until recently, I was the Star Trek Online columnist for Massively. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah. So we're big, big lovers of the game. We talk about it all the time. Matter of fact, there's a segment in our show that we talk about Star Trek Online and the storytelling in the game. So, um, if well, I'm glad you're there. If you haven't I'll played, look it for the US profit. Season what? The new season that just came out because the oh. icons are a huge part of it. Yeah, I, yeah, I've I've heard that, and I've received some flack somewhere in comments that I'm ruining the Iconians because they are they're bad guys in in Star Trek Online. Just but, shut their faces. Jeez. Yeah, that's pretty much. <laughs> it's a different take for sure. Yeah, but, it's a know, great different take. I like the her, idea that it's a you know. Well, it, perspectives and and hit you know it's all the different perspectives. So yeah, yeah. I was going to have say this, so I will fuck <laughs> off and just enjoy the stuff for what it is. I do not officially endorse this statement. <laughs> no, I, that's why I say it. You can't it. say it, but I will. You know, right. and it's it's not it's not like the Iconians are the Klingons or the Romulans. You know what yeah. I mean? Or the Cardassians. Right. They they were mentioned a few times at at best, and they were never. Oh, people just get oh. <laughs> I agree. So next question: Do you have a favorite adjective? Do you overuse it? And is there an adjective you loathe? I've never thought. This is my entire life. Yeah, the author's always <laughs> several acts. This yeah, is usually, when they start cursing at yeah, us. Yeah, this is usually when they start cursing at us. Well, oh. uh, let me see. Let me Google adjectives here. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, a word um, that describes. Yeah. Hmm. Because to admit, it, like I, I know a lot of good words, but my general vocabulary is just pretty uh, common. I'll, I'll actually, I'll actually widen it out a little bit because you're a script writer. Do you oh, find you. what what phrase um, do you constantly have to find yourself deleting from your character's dialogue? What word or phrase do you kind of go, "Oh God, I said it again." I, <laughs> as long as it's not a like a character affectation, right? Indeed. Oh, good All one. Right. Thank you, Teal'c, for that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I, I'm not even kidding. I, 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 I loved Stargate, actually, before I loved Star Trek and as a kid. And I heard Teal'c use that word, and it has been a huge part of my vocabulary all my life because of Teal'c. Uh, you, will, you will love to hear this then because I've met Christopher Judge on several occasions. He's that's awesome. awesome. Lovely, lovely, sweet, sweet man. He who certainly is. is. And he's so nice to people in the smoking area. Yeah, he is. A, he's <laughs> the big smoker. <laughs> oh, I But didn't he know uses that. the word indeed all the time. <laughs> That's great. I didn't know he actually used it in real life. He, he, I don't think he knows he does. <laughs> he picked it up after what ten seasons. Yeah, I wonder if he's <laughs> that know, that's, that's a better word than you know or yeah. like. Mm-hmm. That just drives me. You know, up a fucking you know wall, indeed, or everything. <laughs> oh, fuck. 
Have I done bad? That was the thrust. No, you. I don't think I've heard any. Oh, good. Because I've I've found that, especially like if people are asking me questions or interviewing me, I tend to say you know, and I'm really trying to stop doing it. So I guess I didn't notice. Awesome. I think our questions are so thought provoking. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, the question the question that I I wanted to just say was the reason why we we asked that question is because a lot of our listeners are, you know, aspiring writers or they're practicing or they're they're honing their craft, and I wanted it. We want them to know that it happens to everyone. That there's always yeah, those little things that that come in and tick, and that's what editing is for, and that's and that it's okay, that it's okay. Yeah. You get in there and you and several you of our out. several of our guests who are, are repeat guests are New York Times bestselling authors who who oh. love that question, you know. Yeah. Yeah. David, you know? David Mack. That's when David Mack <laughs> said, "You son of a bitch, I'm going to kill you." Uh, <laughs> that's true. Here, here and, and sometimes when they come on, you know, they'll have new words for us. <laughs> oh. that's true. Here's the big question. This is the big Terry. Did you have any to ask before I get to the to the big one? No, I'm good. Thank you. Oh, this is it, man. This has been easy. Oh well. If you were given the green light to kill a major Star Trek fan <laughs> character. Which would you pick? Oh, there's ah, so many to choose from. Exactly. And you'll never be as evil as Christine Thompson. Why? Who's Star Trek Online's writer? Oh, who'd she kill out of interest? Or should I answer first and then... <laughs> she killed Esri. Oh, really? Yeah. That's not too bad. I, I don't know. It's Elfin. horrifying. <laughs> Why is that horrifying? Because I love Esri Dax. If you, if you read the current, the way the novels are currently going, she's the captain of the USS Aventine, which is a oh. best class that's in, in Star Trek Online. She single-handedly beat the board. No, she didn't. <laughs> she did not. No, she did not. Um, <laughs> but the character has grown, as you can imagine. She's a captain now. And it, she gets there through a logical way. It's not, let's just make... Yeah. And she, I think if she had had more time on DS9, she could have grown a lot, because I thought her character had a lot of potential. It was too bad she only had one season. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> so, who would you kill off? If CBS well, said, yeah, you get to kill off a major canon character, who would you kill off? I'm, I'm tempted to say Jean-Luc. <sighs> You're not the first person to say so. Really? Yep. Is that is that like the easy choice? No. Everyone picks Jean. No, it's uh, the, no. I think yeah. it was just David Mack. I think David oh. Mack is the only other person who chose. I yeah. think we've had the whole spectrum run. I mean, really? Yeah. I, we I, we did have a Kirk, didn't we? Somebody that yeah. said that that was their dream. Did, wasn't that Dayton? Dayton Ward. I, well, Kirk's already dead. Went, so right. Oh, right. No, but if they were, he would have a chance to to. Right. We've, yeah. we've had the spectrum like. Uh, People that we didn't expect authors to say, and we were like, what, what, wow, never even thought of that. You know, nicely done. Yeah. But I think the only person who said Picard was David Mack, who who thought that he would, he, it would be a great opportunity for, for some fantastic storytelling. So you're oh, yeah, in good totally. company. Awesome. Now I feel special. <laughs> 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 well, uh, that's kind of our gig. That's our shtick. Cool. I enjoyed your shtick. <laughs> good. I'm glad. She said. Yeah, I knew that was coming. <laughs> well, that's well, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, well, you're welcome. Anytime. And again, and, everybody. And thank you for putting the spotlight on the race, which deserves the spotlight since they got bent over repeatedly <laughs> yeah. throughout the series runs and, and even in the movies, Star Trek Three. I'm looking at you. Um, <laughs> And also, just for anybody who um, is is going to get upset, you are welcome for me ruining the Romulans. I'm sure somebody will say it. I have, so I'm. Th- I'm. You know, I. I. There I don't say. I think it's there's room for all sorts of stories, and I'm excited yeah. to see where this goes. Again, everybody who's listening, uh, you've been listening to uh, Tommy Craft, and he is the man who does stuff. <laughs> the man who does stuff. Got your uh, new business card. Yeah, I actually love that. 
He makes it go. He makes it yeah. go. Uh, he makes Star Trek Horizon go. And you can uh, check out the Kickstarter and the trailer as well as the first scene of Star Trek Horizon at StarTrekHorizon.com as well as over at the Kickstarter page. And you said there's a YouTube page as well. So all you have to do is search on Star Trek Links Horizon. Links will be in our show notes. And, oh, yep. there you go. And, and links will be in the show the, notes. I should say that the YouTube page, too, is uh, it's not called Star Trek Horizon or anything. It's called Project and Resource. And it's basically like my YouTube space. Your where I've uploaded all, Yeah, it's where I've uploaded all my films and everything over the years. And now it's the Star Trek Horizon space as well. Okay. And just for our listeners, that's Project uh, N as in capital N or just yeah. like Nancy Resource, which is R-E-S-O-R-U-R-C-E. And uh, that's Wait, kind of – isn't that <laughs> R-E-S-O-U-R-C-E? Yeah, I just didn't sound like that was what you said. So no. I get some extra R's in there or, or something. Oh, sorry. No. Project and resource. There you go. Yes, sir. The links will be in show notes. No, I'm not drinking. I'm being a good girl. Oh, and this, that's not a joke. She, we, we've had – yeah. I've been blitzed before on air, and it's usually – We have – oh, if you want a fun time, <laughs> go to our webpage – and find uh, our shows from Vegas. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I can only imagine. From the Star Trek convention. Last year we did, and we're going to do it again this year, it's Breakfast with G&T. Where the waiter stole the show. Yeah, we yeah. literally have the recorder going at the breakfast table, so like, you hear <laughs> Terry going, and I want, can I get butter on that? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> orange juice, please. And we're talking about it. And then did you see J.G. Hertzler walk through? And then you hear, well, I guess I'll have my eggs sunny side up. <laughs> That's great. If you guys, I want the 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 waiter. I mean, I thought he was going to sing us a song. Oh, he, he was great. The mic and, yeah. and fans of our show just walking out. It's like my breakfast with Blassie. Yeah, <laughs> only, only well, two people got that. <laughs> I wasn't one of them. Poor Tommy sorry. Andy, Andy Kaufman made a movie called My Breakfast with Blassie. It's like my dinner with Andre, except it's. Andy Kaufman sitting and having breakfast at a Perk, uh, not a Perkins, a Sambo's. Remember Sambo's? Oh, jeez, yeah. At a Sambo's with <laughs> pro wrestling manager slash wrestler, classy Freddie Blassie. How funny. And I do know that name. Yeah, and it's just literally because Andy Kaufman was a huge pro wrestling fan, uh, him talking to Blassie about his career. And it's really hilarious and, and interesting, but there's also like this table of women sitting next to him and Kaufman starts like picking on them and it, none of it's, none of it's scripted. It's just literally the cameras are rolling and like Blassie's chiding him about his eating habits. It's, it's great. Right. You can find it on YouTube. My breakfast with Blassie. I'll look it up. Cool. Well, again, I know we we do this all the time. We just trail on and on and on. Yeah. <laughs> but again, everybody, Tommy Craft uh, from Star Trek Horizon, check it out. Support their uh, Kickstarter. They still have 11 days left. And uh, meet, help them meet some of those stretch goals because so far what we've seen, we really, really like. Thank you. Yes, it's awesome. And uh, good luck. Thank we, you. We, we hope you succeed. You want to take us out, Mike or, or Nick? Go ahead, Mike. All right. Well, this has been uh, GNT Show Supplemental Log. Thank you very much, Tommy Kraft, for joining us, talking about uh, Star Trek Horizon. And uh, until next time, kapla. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. Toodaloo. Joel on true. <laughs> Joel on true. That's right. GNT Show is a busy little beaver production. Music for the GNT show is provided by Warp 11, Grethor, Five Year Mission, and Andrew Allen's Smooth Federation.